The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. Welcome to The People's View, a program dedicated to discussing local, state, and national issues and their effect on the American people. The People's View provides a platform for state representatives and national figures to present their viewpoint. Whether it's social, economic, or financial topics, you'll hear it on The People's View. Hello, this is Carl Seidel, and welcome to People's View. Don't forget that People's View is sponsored by the Nashua Republican City Committee, and you can find out a lot more about our activities on the website, nashuagop.org. And uh, the organization meets the second Thursday of every month, except for July and August. And we have a stakeout on uh, August 16th with Alan West as our guest speaker. But today, we have Jennifer Horn, who is the uh, GOP chairman for the uh, state. And Jennifer, welcome aboard. Thank you very much. Nice to be back. Yes. And uh, what can you tell us of the, now that you had a few months now uh, what in, can the, I tell you? In, your, in your office <laughs> about the situation of the GOP in New Hampshire and what you're looking forward to doing? Sure. The GOP in New Hampshire is alive and well. Mm -hmm. They're thriving, growing. Uh, we've had a, a, the entire Republican Party, I think, has had a very successful Mm -hmm. first six months of the year. Uh, we've seen a number of successes in the State House, uh, especially uh, you know, out of the hands of our leadership in the, in the Senate. They've done a great job there. Uh, the party itself is growing and thriving. We've actually started a number of new town committees already this mm. year. Had a, a very successful event with Senator Rand Paul mm -hmm. and Chairman Reince Priebus. They were in town in May. It's across the spectrum. I, the, the, the Republican Party is alive and well. Good, good. Well, happy to hear that. Uh, can you tell us about any of your uh, plans uh, coming up this fall? Sure, coming up in the fall? Okay. I can't, I can't leak anything that's coming up in the fall All yet. Right. Uh, but I can tell you that we'll be spending the summer uh, just as diligently tracking the uh -huh. missteps and mismanagement uh, that we've seen coming out of the governor's office in the first few months of her term. And uh, we're very interested to... Um, have the opportunity to speak to our federal delegates, uh, uh, Congresswoman Shea Porter, Congresswoman Custer, and Senator Shaheen in August when they hopefully come home and spend some time with their constituents mm -hmm. during the summer recess in Washington. Uh, I know there's a lot going on in the National Republican City Committee. You guys have a big stakeout coming up. Mm -hmm. the, a, a, number, a number of events uh, that will be coming up in the, throughout the summer and, and into the fall, but I, I hate to t tip my hand uh, too far ahead. Okay. Well, you've been having a lot of communications coming out of your office a sure. lot more than uh, previous years. And uh, uh, the activity I think you're pinpointing is that, uh, you know, people on the, uh, de on the Democratic side aren't uh, doing their job completely. Well, I, I'd say that's an understatement, at least if you're talking about the budget. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Governor Hassan, we've been following closely the entire process, obviously. And her initial um, announcement uh, of her, you know, her budget proposal, her budget plan back at the beginning of the session was, to be perfectly honest, a, a huge disappointment. Mm -hmm. I know folks have been following it. It's been well covered by the media in the state. She offered a budget that was a, a balanced, I say in quote mark, you know, because it wasn't actually a balanced budget, but balanced it on $80 million of non-existent casino fees. Mm -hmm. She was relying on fees from an industry that, at that time was illegal in New Hampshire, and here we are all these months later, and it's still mm -hmm. illegal in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. and, and the argument and the problem with that was never about should we have casino gambling or should we not. That's a separate issue. Mm -hmm. That's a separate argument. And it should have remained one. What was so irresponsible was that she wanted to balance the budget going into the next two years on these you know, non-existent fees, um, essentially taking pretend money to fund real programs. Mm -hmm. So that unfortunately set her up and set the state up for a difficult budget process. Um, it, you know, we've been up and down. The, it, it was to, to be completely honest, the proposal that she gave us was so bad, her own party rejected mm -hmm. it. You know, 
Uh, the Democrats in the House came up with their own budget, which was maybe better than hers, but unfortunately still spent uh, and taxed way too much. I mean, the, the Democrat gas tax uh, almost came to be. If it wasn't for the Senate Republicans, mm -hmm. we would have had a significant increase in the gas tax in our state uh, and a number of others as well. But um, as the pr budget goes through the process, it ends up in the hands of the Senate. And luckily, the Republicans still have uh, the majority in the Senate, and they were able to um, get the budget back on track. Senator Chuck Morris, the chairman of the Finance Committee, Senator Jed Bradley, mm -hmm. um, and Senator Peter Bragdon, both in, you know, in leadership, were able to really kind of rein in the spending. Uh, they offered a budget with only 3% increase in spending instead of Governor Hassan's billion dollars mm -hmm. of spending. The House Democrats offered 10.2% increase in spending. Um, and the Republicans were able to pull it back to 3%, while at the same time increasing funding to important health and human services programs, um, restoring funding to important college scholarship mm -hmm. programs. Uh, they did a really good job. And uh, in the final hours in the Committee of Conference, working closely with a couple of the folks in the House, uh, it, it were able to offer what we think is a strong, reasonable, fiscally responsible budget. And the gover lo governor luckily signed it into law. And uh, the current year's budget is finishing with a slight surplus. That finishing with a surplus. And I, we can be partisan, right, since we're yes. both. It's, <laughs> uh, the truth of the matter is, you know, the, the, the budget from the last bienna biennium got a, lot of, mm. got a lot of press, got a lot of play. Uh, and in the end, what we found was that the, the Republican majority actually uh, gave us a budget that covered the costs, mm -hmm. that ran the, the, uh, ran the state efficiently, and, uh, you know, unfortunately, they were forced because of re truly irresponsible spending in a previous Democratic majority. They were forced to make some tough cuts. But here we are now out ahead of the game and able uh, to offer, you know, to, uh, able to start to refund some of the, those more, more critical programs um, and to be able to move forward in a fiscally stable position, which we were not in, mm -hmm. unfortunately, before that. And uh, if we had, you know, if, if folks will recall, leading up to that last biennium, the Democrats had spent us into a hole of over $800 million deficit. Mm -hmm. So the last budget got us out of that, and this budget now allows us to move forward in a stable manner that doesn't overspend, that's not going to lead to another big, um, you know, co fiscal collapse in the budget. And two years from now, hopefully we'll come out a little bit ahead again. And two years from now, hopefully, we'll have a Republican majority. And two <laughs> years from now, a Republican majority. I thought you were going to say a Republican governor. Well, you know, that would be nice. There's so much that a government governor is responsible for, whether it's the budget or anything else. But what we expect from our governors at the core is, is honesty, integrity, and leadership, real leadership. And unfortunately, Governor Hassan has failed the test of leadership in this first process. Mm -hmm. Probably the most important thing that she has to do is offer a fully balanced budget. Um, and they make this argument that, oh, the, the governor offering her proposal is just the first step. Of course it's going to go through the House. It's going to go through the Senate. No. <laughs> yes, it's got to go through the House and the Senate to be approved, but it was her job yeah, that's right. to make the budget and to have it be balanced, to have it be responsible. So it's unfortunate that we had to go through this difficult process. It's unfortunate that um, you know members of the House and the Senate were forced to be on different sides of, of a difficult situation. Um, had the governor done her job to begin with, that wouldn't have happened. And I don't see any signs of the second part of I, I, I would consider the uh, important parts of her job is organizing the administration of implementing all these new laws and, imp and running a very cost-effective uh, operation. I think uh, some of the agencies up there need to be looked at and see how they can be much more effective by uh, doing things for their customers, the voters right. of the New Hampshire. Well, it'd be ni it would be nice if all governments, all state governments and, and the federal government took a more customer service type of approach to things, you know, mm -hmm. a more customer friendly approach. I know that the Republicans were starting down that path and trying to uh, implement some efficiencies, you know, in the last biennium. Um, it, it's difficult to implement our vision of a responsible, fiscally sound, efficient government when you're in the minority and in, in the places that we are. But I have to say, I think that the Senate Republicans have honestly done um, an ex just an extraordinary job, not just on the budget, but on pushing back against and not allowing some of the damage that the House Democrats and the governor wanted to, you know, wanted to implement now that they had at least a good piece of the majority. 
Um, one of the biggest ones that was, I just, for me, I guess the most distressing, one of the most distressing ones that they wanted to, uh, to do, changes they wanted to make was to repeal the scholarship tax credit. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, you know, this was a program that, uh, I always say that, that this was a program that finally opened the door to education equality in our state. You know, many of our families choose to take their children out of the public school and put them in a, an education setting that is more appropriate for that child. And they're able to do that. They, they want to make that choice and they have the financial resources to do it. So many of our families who would like to take their children and bring them to a more appropriate educational uh, mm -hmm. environment aren't able to do that. So the Republicans last time around set up this great program, fully funded by private entities, not taking, uh, you know, not taking state money, and uh, you know, has essentially opened the door for all families in New Hampshire now to try to you know, have that choice. The governor made it a priority to repeal that law mm -hmm. before it was even implemented. Uh, and she built it into her budget, which you know, shows the, the level of priority she gave it. Now, luckily, the Senate was able to stop that. They, they were able to block the repeal effort, even though it made it through the House. But now that it's passed, it really make, has to make us question what Governor Hassan's priorities are mm -hmm. and, and why. Uh, of all the things that she could have focused on, why would she want to go after uh, an education bill that made bet great education available to more kids? Better choice. It makes it, mm -hmm. it makes no sense to me. So, but the, the Senate was able to block that. They were able to block a number of repeal efforts. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's bad government. I think it's bad leadership uh, if every time um, you know, the, the House or the Senate switches hands, their first priority is simply to repeal everything the previ previous major majority mm -hmm. did. Uh, you know, we expect them to come in and bring their ideas to the table and show leadership and, and have the debate on what they think is important, not just try to, you know, you know, scorched earth policy, and, get and rid of everything. And education was one of the things so. they picked on. That, that, that wasn't they, on a, in a number of ways. You're right, yeah. the unique scholarship, uh, um, pr the unique program, which you know, offered um, mm -hmm. higher education dollars to needy students as right. well who want to go on to college. Um, there were there were a number um, uh, putting a placing a moratorium on school charter on school schools, building yeah. aid and charter school funding, um, and and the Senate budget luckily not only uh, returned the funding to charter schools but I believe included funding uh, to start additional charter schools right. I, I think, think for four. four. Yeah. And you know, the, gosh, you would think that making sure that education and education opportunity was expanding in our state, mm -hmm. that would be something we can agree on. That's you would right. think at least that, and, and that's something that, you know, kind of traditionally Democrats have picked on Republicans for. Well, here we have a Republican Party in our state that embraces education mm -hmm. equality and wants to expand mm -hmm. education choice. And it's, you know, the knee-jerk reaction on the other side is to say, oh, there, it must be, there must be something bad about it. If the Republicans are promoting it, it must be bad. Um, but luckily, those programs were preserved. Well, that carried over into the capital budget, too. I don't know if you're uh, familiar with some of the things they've done for the community colleges, which I think is the yes. first step to, to helping some of these people who can't afford the right. uh, four-year colleges. That gets them started and at least provides job opportunities for right. a lot of people. Absolutely. And, and I, again, education and expanding education opportunity, that's something we should all be able to work together on. Um, I'm, so I'm, for me, maybe because I'm a mother, maybe, you know, what, you know whatever it is, uh, there, the, you know, there's a very, um, you know, basic and emotional response when we start talking about making sure children have every possible mm -hmm. opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm very pleased, I'm very proud, honestly, of the efforts of the Senate Republicans. Uh, and, and not to take away anything from the House Republicans, I have to be careful, you know, uh, how, how I phrase it, but... It's really difficult to be in the, in the level of the minority that we're at in the House, um, but our, our speaker and leadership and every single one of the Republic, Republicans in the House have fought for those principled you know, pieces of legislation. And um, considering the position we're in, I think it was a successful year well, for us. I think one of the contributions from the House was the uh, uh, amendments they made to the budget, even mm -hmm. though they were defeated in the House. The Senate got all those amendments. The Senate put got back to pick them up. up exactly. And exactly. I thought that was a nice little twist yeah. to the whole thing. But it, and uh, and that's the way that it should work. Yeah. That's the way the process should work. But um, yeah, that the House Republicans came through and really, you know, really delivered where we needed them to. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, next year, election time rolls around. 
hopefully we'll be able to get the message out, the good res fiscally responsible work that both our, rep our reps and our senators did and expand those numbers a little bit. I'd like to make one, a mention just of one other example that happened uh, in last uh, year, uh, two years ago when they worked with the Department of Justice uh, to help them reorganize their uh, e efficiency of okay. ha handling customers. Oh, two years, back during the last biennium. Yeah, yeah. during the last biennium mm -hmm. where they couldn't convince them in committee to do something, so they said, well, we feel so strongly about this that we're going to hold back X million dollars from your budget until you do this because you'll find out that it works. And it's that we're right. setting up a centralized phone system to, to handle all the people that want to know what's happening in our different uh, courts that are all around uh, the state. And it's working out so well that they are able to cut back on a number of people and actually do a better job and get problems solved a lot more quickly because it's all centralized and it right. works beautifully. But that's the kind of system that comes from business experience. And you would think that moderni modernizing your phone system should be an right. easy argument. Right. I mean, come on, of all the things we're going to fight about, seriously, and, and in this day and age of technology, um, it, it's good. It's good to hear that it's working out. That it's yeah. bringing the obvious efficiencies that that we all, you know, uh, the folks fighting for it figured that it would. Um, I do think sometimes that we fight just for the sake of fighting, and that's not. It's not good. It's not good for problem solving. It's not good for our neighbors. It's not good for the people that our elected representatives uh, are supposed to be the voice for. Mm -hmm. um, so, in little things like that, you know, you want to believe that we can just get the job done. Well, the one they're working on now, and I'm hoping that there's a bipartisan support for it, is the one-stop shop uh, for people who are looking at uh, for permits or s uh, services oh, sure. from the state, right. where you can go to one location you do, and you find out which departments uh, uh, handle your situation so that you sure. don't have to you know, go wandering around and every time you finish with one, you have to go, to another, to go, go to down the block. So. Well, and the other thing I think that we hear a lot of um, push back on or complaints from in citizens on is just how little of our state government is online. Mm -hmm. You know, being able to access whatever it is you need to do or process or order or apply for uh, online, which is where the vast majority of, of business and transactions take place. Oh, yeah. And so oh, yeah. uh, but I think there's a lot of moder modernizing that can take place, not just in New Hampshire. I mean, this is no, not, no, this, not, this is not, yeah, this is, this is, you know, an epidemic in government, unfortunately. But um, it's good to hear that New Hampshire is taking some steps well, in the right well, direction. I think we had some new, uh, very good people uh, elected last time, and some right. of them didn't make it back. But, uh, you know, if we can do something like that, we got a, a number of uh, young people, which I'm assuming that uh, you're very interested absolutely, in. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I, I anticipate that the ballot next year uh, will be filled with bright, energetic, dedicated, mm -hmm. fiscally responsible Republicans. There you go. So <laughs> we are... Uh, and, and, and I, I fully anticipate that the vast majority of them are going to win their elections. Good, How's that? Good. How about that for a campaign <laughs> trying, to, trying to stay on message. Yeah. Uh, but, I, you know, I really do believe that. I think that, when, I think that when you can reasonably and rationally lay out the argument, this is what you get on this side, this is what you get on this side, your choice, mm -hmm. I think people nine times out of ten will always choose um, the individual, the party, the, you know, the whatever, the effort that is fighting for responsibility, that is fighting, um, and, and we, we use the phrase fiscally responsible all the time, but what does that mean? How, how, how does that translate for voter? Those are the <clears throat> that's the effort that's trying to leave more of your paycheck in your pocket. Mm -hmm. You know, that's mm -hmm. the effort that's trying to grow more jobs so that the 40 or 50,000 unemployed granite staters out there who want a job will have one right in their own backyard. You know, that's the effort that's trying to leave um, you know, individual liberty and, uh, you know, re personal responsibility in your hands, in your mm -hmm. lap, where you can make your own decisions. You decide where your child should go to school. You decide where the best opportunity is to educate your child. Um, so, you know, those are the types of things that I think are core to what being a Republican is, and that's what's core to the Republican effort. And if nothing else, I hope as chairman I can remind people of what we, who we really are as Republicans outside of kind of that, you know, um, dramatic mm -hmm. democratic rhetoric and spin that we hear all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I hope so too. That's one of the reasons I moved to New Hampshire is right. because I felt that uh, this was the live free or die and uh, 
In other words, they gave you more personal responsibility. Right. And that's well, at, right, and, and personal liberty, personal right. freedom. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's how our founding fathers imagined the world, mm -hmm. and I think it's how we function best. Unfortunately, you know, we can step outside of Concord and look at what's happening in Washington. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and we could easily say what's been happening, happening in Washington for the last five years, but the truth is we can just look at the last five, six, seven, eight months, mm -hmm. and there is just an, an enormous, it's like a, a, a landslide of um, corruption and inefficiency, and uh, I would say in many cases um, incompetence, you know, the, whether we're talking about um, the fact that we still don't know the truth about what happened in Benghazi, uh, we still don't have a budget, a balanced budget. Have we? When was the last time we had a balanced budget in Washington? Um, you know, a number of issues. And and I have to say, I, I imagine that uh, even though we feel very affectionately towards Senator Ayotte here in Nashua, mm -hmm. because she is our hometown girl, I think folks across the state are probably looking at how hard she's working on so many of these issues, so many of these pocketbook issues, and uh, these integrity issues. You know, when it comes, whether it's Benghazi or. Um, you know, trying to bring terrorists into the United States for, for trials and things like that. She's been working awfully hard, and mm -hmm. um, I think people are seeing it and appreciating it. Yeah, I think so. I think there's, there's lack of transparency, too. I mean, right. whenever there's a problem, oh, we're having it under investigation. We're investigating. We can't talk about it because and, it's and being where's, investigated. Well, where's the results of the investigation? Oh, now well, it's old hat. Don't get yeah, me. That's well, you know, I worry sometimes, <laughs> and I worry sometimes that we have be that we have been exposed to so much that is bad right. in Washington, that once kind of the you know that once it hits its peak in the media coverage, it goes downhill, and we all forget that it's there, that it's still unresolved. Um, I think probably the most extraordinary moment that I can remember in the last six months was Secretary of State Hillary Clinton being oh, asked. Yeah. What happened in Benghazi? Why did they die? Why wasn't help sent? Where were you? Where was the president? Who made the decisions? And her answer was, what difference does it make? It's over. It's done. What difference does it make? Oh, my gosh. It makes an extraordinary amount of difference. Yeah. Is it going to happen again? Are the people who you know, you know, may potentially be responsible for that being held accountable? Uh, and that's just one example. Um, and Senator Ayotte was a, a loud voice in that in that particular circumstance, um, as she has been, I think, on a number of very critical issues since she went down there. I think it's destroying our trust in government when you see some of these things, because you know, some whether it's incompetency, incompetency, or whether it's uh, just I don't know, lack in, of in knowledge, malfeasance or Malfe sometimes, you know, right? Uh, you know, whatever it is, we want to know why and. What can you do so it doesn't happen again? Well, and I think that that's part of what's feeding into the frustration of Republicans and Democrats, quite honestly. Um, you know, it, it might seem like suddenly a group of individuals are blowing up over one issue or another issue, but I think there's been an accumulation of frustration and disappointment in a lot of how uh, our elected officials conduct themselves. Um, we always want to believe that even if our candidate doesn't win the presidency, that the one who does win will go to the White House and um, work for the American people with honor and integrity. And uh, certainly over the last several months, uh, and, and I would say over the last five years, but certainly over the last several months, uh, it has become clear that that's simply not the case. It's simply not the case. And, and even, even, uh, even you know, the, most, the most partisan of Democrats are finding it difficult to defend the president today. And, um, and to try to make the argument for him. In fact, a lot of them are starting to already make the argument for uh, the next Democratic mm -hmm. administration you know, that they mm -hmm. imagine and trying to get past this one as well. Um, but when you talk about transparency and, and um, being able to you know, access our elected representatives and get our questions answered, you say we just want to know why. Um, I think that that's an issue where, again, we see a very clear distinction between the way our, here in, in New Hampshire at least, between the way that our Democratic elected federal representatives deal with us and the way our Republican elected uh, mm -hmm. senator deals with us. Mm -hmm. You know, you can go down to Main Street in Nashua and walk in the door and have immediate access to her staff any day of the week. Mm -hmm. uh, the senator herself comes back to the state and does 10 town mm -hmm. halls mm -hmm. every year. Mm -hmm. She promised when she ran that she would not hide from us. 10 town halls a year, every county, every year. 
um, and is home, you know, I, th I would guess, probably 99% of the weekends um, since she's been in office. You know, not just home with her family, but home That's with right. us. Yeah. Uh, I would suggest that you could knock on Senator Shaheen's door and find a very different, a very different response. Uh, often, no response. That's often, true. nobody in an office. Um, when was the last time she did uh, a town hall, much less multiple town halls? Mm -hmm. Where has she been for the last six years? Uh, I, you know, she's been something of a wallflower in the Senate, and I don't think that that's a good thing. You know, she, no. we sent her to fight. Right. We sent her to speak up for us. Um, you know, we look at the fact, what, what's one of the biggest scandals in Washington right now is the IRS. Mm -hmm. What is supposed to be a nonpartisan government agency actually targeting and going after Americans based on their political beliefs, that's... That's unheard your, of. It's extraordinary. Yeah. It, it, lose trust it's, right away. Ex it, right. It, it cannot be tolerated. Yeah. And yet we learned that our own senator was part of it. Senator Shaheen was one of six Democrats who signed a letter asking the IRS to investigate these organizations further. Mm -hmm. She used the AF, you know, Americans for Prosperity, AFP, as an example when talking about mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we'd like her to answer some questions. But she doesn't. Can't and get to her. Can't ask her. Can't get a response. And the media has not even asked those questions. And the media hasn't asked those questions. But you know what, Carl? I'm sure you've heard me say this before. Uh, the media has a job to do. Yeah. And sometimes they do it, sometimes they don't do it. I think the national media is much more incompetent these days, for, for lack of a better word, than our local media here in New Hampshire is. But as citizens of a, you know, uh, a free uh, and, and you know, democratic republic nation, it's our responsibility to make sure that those questions get answered. You, mm -hmm. we, we can't rely on the media. We're not supposed to have to rely have to on the media. to keep these issues alive. So Absolutely. And we've got to stand up and make our own voices heard. Well, and the IRS is going to be uh, in, in charge of implementing some of the Obamacare? And how oh, are they sure. Going to right. do that? I, exa <laughs> that is the way the law was written, that the yeah. IRS was going to be part of it. They're hiring 20,000 more people so. just to do that. Well, and let's not forget that the uh, most recent implementation through Obamacare is the doubling of student loan rates. Right. Uh, we, it just, just, just yesterday, as a matter of fact, July 1st, I think, became a lot more expensive to go right. to college in they this country. They couldn't come up with something that keeps it lower. Again, yeah. I thought we could all agree on the idea yeah. that we want education to be accessible right. to more people, not fewer. Uh, and it just became twice as expensive to get a loan and to go to college in our country. What was when they took it over in the beginning so. that they were going to save money? For the, somehow, this was going to, somehow this was going yeah. to save us. Listen, I, I don't even want to hear that anymore. Everything they do, you know, they come up with a way to manipulate the numbers and say, look, it's going to decrease the, yeah, right. the deficit. It's yeah. going to save us a trillion dollars here, a right. trillion dollars there. And here we are at over $16 trillion. And that was, that was going to so, pay for some of these uh, exorbitant uh, programs. Well, the had. idea is that it's it, the, somehow, I, I don't know, we're still stuck in that maze. Somehow Obamacare is going to save us money. Mm -hmm. It's not working out for businesses across the country who are all you know, doing everything they can to avoid having to be drawn into it, who are um, decrease, cutting hours, who are letting people go, losing people losing their jobs directly because mm -hmm. of the expense of implementing Obamacare. Uh, we're supposed to trust the IRS now to implement it and believe mm -hmm. that somehow they are going to be nonpartisan and fair in that administration. And um, they're going to be able just, to deduct these fines right from the paycheck. It's, it's <laughs> let's not even get started on all the possibilities. I mean, it's, it's surprising but it, when we find out exactly what was in that so, bill. Well, I, I don't think anybody even now, you know, two, two, three years later, have has full understanding yeah. and, um, and, and, and it is very uh, distressing to, to think about the fact that we are now trying to pay for what is essentially, for what is in fact a program that's rejected by the majority of Americans. Unlike most legislation, mm -hmm. un, mo most of the time if legislation is unpopular, little by, and it gets passed anyway, little by little people get used to it, they accept it, they ignore it, whatever. Obamacare has become progressively more unpopular, mm -hmm. month after month, year after year, as um, Americans learn about it and start feeling the direct impact on their lives. Uh, and you and I ta have talked about this. Uh, I certainly talked about it in my congressional campaigns mm -hmm. back in, uh, you know, uh, uh, I certainly talked about universal health care as far back as my 2008 campaign. Um, but th the people are rejecting it. And somehow we, the government feels justified in funding it through college education loans. Yes. I, it's, <laughs> I, I, don't know, I don't know what to say about that. It's stunning. 
It's well, stunning. The other thing the young people are going to get hurt with is, is the increases in the, that what they pay in health insurance to cover right. the older people because they're right. They're trying Once to they it. finally hit the age of 26 right. yeah. and have to pay for their they're, own health insurance, they're going to be um, and and that's going to be a struggle for a lot of those young people because what we see right now is that over 50 percent of college graduates are either unemployed or not employed in their field of study. And may have a so lot of student underemployed. loans to pay and off. And have yeah. a lot of student loans to pay off. Uh, those kids that are heading off to school starting this fall are, are going to have a much harder time making those payments. Well, Jennifer, we're going to have to have you oh. back again. We've got a whole lot of Good. things to talk about. Well, I always enjoy it. we out of time again, and uh, I really appreciate you coming out and uh, giving us uh, your perspective on this whole... Thank uh, you very much. It's my pleasure, and I look forward to seeing you at the Nashua Republican City Committee Stakeout on yes. August 14th. There you go. No, August 16th. August 16th. August 16th. It's a Friday. That's and right. And Alan West is going to be our speaker. Thanks so much, thank Carl. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening in. This is sponsored by the Nashua Republican City Committee. Go to nashuagop.org to find out more about us. Thank you. Seating program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters.